Okay, the successor to the orange book is the so-called <coughs> common criteria, which, how generic of a name can you come up with, the common criteria? Anyway, uh, this supposedly, uh, I think it was official, became official in 1998, but it had been kicking around for some time before that, so probably from you know the early 90s is when it really got uh, going. Now, it's, uh, you know, the orange book was how big? It's like 115 pages. This is like a thousand plus pages. Now I know this for a fact because at my startup company we were trying to, we were hoping to sell to the government, and so it was my job to look up this common criteria stuff and you know read about it and see if we had hope any hope. You know what we, what did we need to do and all that sort of stuff. Volumes and volumes of pages here, and it's mind numbing. You know it's just stuff will drive me nuts. Uh, and it's not just. A U.S. government standard, it's an international government standard, which makes it even worse, you know, even more bureaucratic. I think uh, if not all, at least most of the NATO countries follow this and a few others, so it's, you know, pretty widespread uh, thing. Uh, and it is relevant today, if you do want to sell to the government, there's a certain level that you need to meet uh, to sell to the U.S. government for almost anything. Uh, for higher, you know, if you want your product to be used for, you know, classified military sorts of things then higher levels uh, would apply. Now the levels, uh, they call these uh, evaluation assurance levels, EALs, um, and they go from one through seven. So one being the lowest, seven being the highest. So here you go. Oh, okay, here's, here's something to think about. Now suppose you have a product and, you know, so the EALs here are one through seven. So you have a product that's evaluated at EAL 4, so it's past that certification. And that's sort of the minimum that people usually shoot for because that's the minimum the U.S. government usually has for purchasing a product. It has to be EAL 4. Okay, so suppose you have a product that's EAL 4. You have another product that does the same thing, it's EAL 5. Does that mean the EAL 5 product is better, more secure than the EAL 4 product? What do you think? It ought to if numbers mean anything. <laughs> no, this is a government standard, so it doesn't work the way you think. Okay. <laughs> so, so what it means when you have an EAL four is mean it means that you went to a certification lab and you paid them to evaluate it up to level four, and it passed. It means the other guy they got theirs evaluated up to a level five, and it passed. Yours at level four could maybe have passed level five, or maybe even level six, but you didn't try for those because it costs more money. So you just tried for the level four. Okay, so it doesn't necessarily mean that the product's better. And in fact, there could be a product that's not certified at all that's more secure than any of them. Right? It just didn't bother to go through the certification process because it's very expensive. You know, it's like on the order of six figures to get your product evaluated up to level four, and the higher levels are much more complex than that. So, so keep that in mind. You know, don't be too impressed. You see something? It's got one of these EALs. Okay. So, okay, so here's the different levels, uh, and here's what they call them. Uh, they don't really mean much to me. Functionally tested, I don't know what that means. They pressed enter and it worked, I guess. Uh, so that's not much. This is the level, that, again, that if you're selling to the government, this is really the baseline. This is where you have to get to or you're not, you haven't really accomplished much. So it's methodically designed, tested, and reviewed. So even at the design phase, you have to decide if you want to do this, right? Because you have to have all kinds of records and documents that you can turn over and show them that it was designed you know, appropriately and tested and reviewed. Um, okay, then you get up to level seven, the highest. You're back again with the formal methods. You really need to formally prove that everything you claim uh, is there or works correctly. Okay, so again, level four is the one people usually shoot for, you know, at a minimum. Uh, if you have like a payroll system they're using in government, they would want an EAL four, right? Because it's uh, the minimum that people use in the government for the most part. Uh, the EAL 7 requires formal proofs. Now there's a common criteria website, so you can go there and you can look up all the certified products. I found a total of two products certified at EAL 7. <laughs> okay, so two, this thing's been around, you know, for more than a decade. That's not very impressive, two products at, at the highest level. And even those, um, 
I, I believe one of those is like a digital signature software. You know, so that you could see maybe formally proving that it's correct and all that. Cause it's very straightforward, self-contained. It's not doing anything too tricky, uh, and so on. So, yeah. uh, okay, who performs these evaluations? There are government labs, okay, and they charge very hefty fees to do this. Okay, so um, get a job in one of those labs. They're government accredited labs. They're not actually government run labs. So. Yes. Did you have to investigate whether any Microsoft products were on the EA list? Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. I would assume they have to be in there somewhere. Something has to have been done with some of those uh, because they are widely used. You know, even in government. Or maybe there's an exemption because <laughs> they have no choice. <laughs> yeah, I know I've seen NT4 on uh, Navy ships. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that would be a, probably a good sign. Something's been there. Uh, okay, so that's it for uh, system certification. I, mean, I think it's good that you've seen those things because they could actually come up in uh, uh, in practice. Okay, now kind of back to the main theme here: uh, authorization. So again, authentication. We've already looked at this in Chapter Seven. Authorization. We're trying to restrict the uh, uh, the abilities of authenticated users to do certain things. So again, it's a form of access control, as we said. Now, uh, the classic view here of authorization, which we'll look at next, uh, there's sort of two approaches here, two complementary approaches. You know, we can use access control lists, or we can use uh, capabilities. Now, just a warning, access control list is one of those terms that's way overloaded, right? Has many, many different meanings, or a very specific meaning. Um, okay, so think of a computer system. You and suppose it's a Unix-like system, right? So you have users, you have, you have resources that the users want to use. Now, if you're a user, you're allowed to do certain things to certain files, right? And those are usually specified as read, write, or execute. R W X. Okay. So for it, so we'll specify those just in the form of a big, big matrix here. Over on this side, we'll put the users, we'll call those guys subjects. <coughs> Across the top, we'll put the resources, we'll call those uh, objects. Okay, so subjects and objects. All right, so for example, uh, Bob, he can uh, read or execute the accounting program, he can read the accounting data, he can't do anything with the insurance data or payroll data, and so on, okay? Now, Alice and Bob here are supposed to represent just ordinary users. Who's Sam? Do you suppose? System administrator. System administrator. There you go. Okay, so he's a big, powerful guy, right? Look, he can read, write, execute. He can do lots of stuff that ordinary users can't do. Uh, okay, now there's something kind of weird about this here. What's the weird thing? Sam can write to the program, but he can't access all the data. Uh, okay, maybe that's weird, but there's something even weirder. Yeah, Nexus Accounting. Yeah, okay, so what about this? Accounting program. Is accounting program a user or is accounting program a resource? Well, I mean, obviously it's a resource. So what's it doing here as a user or, you know, subject, right? Why do we treat it as a subject? Well, it's not a subject, but we can pretend it's a subject if we want. And so maybe it's useful to do that. Why might it be useful? What are we trying to accomplish here by pretending the accounting program here is a subject? It might access other resources. Yeah, okay, so the accounting program has certain privileges, certain things it can do. Okay, how about users? Well, look at the users. Accounting data. I'm not letting the users write to the accounting data, but I'm letting the accounting program write to the accounting data. Why might that be a good idea? So that accounting data cannot be tampered by any other programs. Yeah, okay, so, you know, I come from a long line of accountants. I know all about this accounting stuff. Um, you think computer science is boring? <laughs> so um, the, the idea is this. So the ordinary user might go in and change the accounting data in a way that it's no longer in balance, right? The debits and credits don't match up anymore, and so you broke it. Or they might intentionally go in and you know commit fraud, change something in there. So we don't allow that. They can read it, they can look at it, but they can't make a change. If they want to make a change, how do they do that? 
to accounting for. They have to fire up the accounting program and enter the data into the program, then the program makes the change. <coughs> so the program presumably knows about debits and credits and makes sure that everything is in balance before it's done. Okay? That's the idea. Okay, now is that foolproof? Can we can anybody here get around our protection? Sam, okay, Sam's a pretty powerful guy. What could he do? He could just change the accounting program any way he wants to do anything he wants it to do, <laughs> right? So he could make changes. But for the ordinary users, it's kind of a level, kind of indirect level of protection. Okay, so this is good. This kind of, uh, you know, as far as access control, this tells us everything we need to know. Okay, every user's here, every resource is here. You know, if somebody wants to access a resource, you just look it up in this matrix and see if they're allowed to do what they're trying to do. If so, let them do it. If not, don't let them do that. So the operating system can look at this and make all those decisions. There's a potential problem. What's the potential problem? Well, think about this. Suppose you have a lot of resources. You know, you might have thousands, you might have tens of thousands of resources on your computer, right? Suppose you have a fair number of users. I don't know, you might have hundreds of users. How big is this matrix? Big, okay, it's big, that's all we need to know. It's like millions of entries. How often do you have to consult this matrix? All the time, anytime anybody wants to do anything, <laughs> you have to consult this matrix. So it's, uh, there's an efficiency issue. You know, how do you deal with such a large matrix for so many different resources and so on? Okay, so you know, thousands of users or maybe even hundreds it would be fine, but tens of thousands certainly of uh, resources. So a matrix with millions of entries. So how do we deal with that? How do we manage such a big matrix? Does anybody know? What do we do in practice? Groups. What? Groups. Uh, groups, okay, that's kind of a, Another level up from what we're going to say here. Why is a matrix with a million entries a problem? You could have hundreds of users, right, all trying to access this, right? Millions of entries. Uh, even if it's not a problem, there's a more efficient way to deal with it. 